hello everyone, wherever you are. Um, I, I know we have participants joining us from around the world. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, it, um, it would be wonderful us, for us to know who's joining us today and from where. So I invite you to, to please share with us your location and perhaps also the organization that you come from. So maybe we can build a bit more of a community that we're, we're seeking to support today. Um, so welcome to Inquahe Talks. It's a series of webinars where we aim to connect our membership with the broader international higher education and quality assurance community to discuss today's pressing issues. And we bring together experts and practitioners to share insights, challenges, best practices, and propose solutions to ensure that higher education and quality assurance continues to serve uh, their best um, to and serve our increasingly interconnected communities. Um, so I'm going to assume that many of you are familiar with our agency. We are INQUAHE, the International Network for Quality Assurance Agencies in Higher Education. And, um, and we offer a number of member services, including a journal, a bulletin, a query service, funding for projects, and, um, and of course, our events. So we have, a, we have our annual uh, conference coming up, our, our forum beginning in, uh, in June 2024. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that towards the end of our session. So my name is Mary Catherine Lennon. I'm an Inquahe board member, as well as the head of research, uh, international and special projects at the post-secondary education, post-secondary education quality assessment board in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And I'm affiliated with the University of Toronto's Center for Canadian and International Higher Education. So it's my pleasure to be chairing this session and moderating this session. Um, we, we have a really interesting topic today. It's called grappling with cost pressures for effectiveness and efficiencies in quality assurance. And um, through our conversations at the board and with our members in, um, in smaller venues and in larger venues, such as our conference, um, we recognize that we're in an era defined by relentless financial pr pressures, external demands and evolving stakeholder expectations. And so we believe that we're trying to, with quality assurance navigate this complex landscape of maintaining and enhancing quality standards. And so what we're going to present with you for you today is presentations and candid discussions that are going to delve deep into how these external pressures are shaping our practice, highlight the pivotal role of stakeholder engagement, and introduce innovative ideas that challenge conventional methodologies to really ensure that the enduring principles of quality assurance um, endure despite these financial constraints. So I'm really delighted to introduce to you our esteemed panels, each bringing a wealth of experience and insight to the table. I should first note that we have had a change of speakers. Um, our colleague Karen Belfer from the Ontario Quality Assurance Service has had a death in the family and is unable to join us today. Um, so while we think of her and, and share our condolences, we really are delighted that her colleague um, Sylvie Mainville um, has is able to be here with us and share their joint work. So thank you very much, Sylvie, for for joining us. Um, okay. Great. You want to have a, a quick word just to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sylvie Mainville. I am the manager of quality assurance at Ontario College Quality Assurance Service. We're an agency who does program level uh, validations as well as institutional level audits for Ontario, the province of Ontario in Canada. Nice to be here. Thanks so much, Sylvie. Um, and as advertised, we also have Ronnie Heinz. He's the director, deputy director for international development at AQAS. That's the Agency for Quality Assurance in Germany. Ronnie, do you want to say hi? Sure. Hello. So that's a good morning, good afternoon. And for some of us, I see like in the chat people joining from Jakarta. So good evening. Um, I'm Ronnie Heinz. I'm the deputy director of uh, AQAS, Aquas, uh, which is the largest German accreditation body. Uh, we're a nonprofit. I'm in this field for 13 years, now basically overseeing our um, international activities. And it's a true pleasure to join you here and uh, see some comments of people that I know, but also see uh, the faces of great colleagues around here. That's great. Thank you so much, Ronnie. And Vicky, I'll turn to you. Vicky Stott, you're with the QAA in the UK. I am indeed. Hi, Mary Kath. Hello, everybody. It's lovely to be here. I'm Vicky Stott. I'm the chief executive of the QAA in the UK. We are 
the UK's um, independent quality body. And um, as we'll be exploring in a little bit, we work in slightly different ways under slightly different pressures in each of the nations of the UK and internationally. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So I know that together you are going to offer some really interesting and frank perspectives on how agencies manage priorities, innovate policies and practices, and, uh, and navigate this increasingly entrepreneurial landscape of quality assurance. Um, so before handing it over to our esteemed panel, I have just a few words for housekeeping. Um, so for your information, each of our panel members will give a short presentation in order to sort of ground the conversation. And following that, the panel will have sort of a semi-structured conversation in, in response to prepared questions. And following that, we're really happy to open the floor to the audience. Now, you'll notice that we have muted your, all of your microphones, and that really is just to help with the smooth running of the event. Um, and similarly, your cameras have also been disabled. Nonetheless, we are very keen to hear from you. Um, these are intended to be interactive webinars. So please use the Q&A or the chat function to ask questions an informed discussion at any time, which um, we might take your, your interjections as we go along, or we might hold them off until the dedicated Q&A session. Um, please note that the webinar will be recorded and it will also be made available for free access following the event on the Inquahay website. Um, and so with that, we can begin. Um, Sylvie, would you like to please start things off for us? I'm very happy to, thank you very much. Hello to everyone, it's nice to be here. Um, I'm happy to be here in Karen's place today to speak with you about our experiences with institutional institutions grappling with the high cost of quality assurance. One of the main strategic goals that we are discussing currently for our upcoming new plan is how to inform the right people in the institutions of the return on the investment in quality assurance. Can they see its worth or do they just, you know, study to the test? And that's one of our questions. So it is true, quality processes are associated with high costs. We think of mandatory accreditation, which are most often maybe government or program based, where there's little choice. In comparison, voluntary recognition can also be very costly and are often more about differentiation or prestige. But do institutions really engage in these QA activities because they want to know if they're continuously improving their processes and activities. And are these op options, all these accreditations, are they available to all institutions? So the high costs we've noticed have consequences and they can result in alienation and discrimination against rural and smaller institutions and those with less cash flow and resources. But one important outcome depends on the institution's attitude. So are institutions engaging in these activities because they're checkboxes as a means to an end, or are they actually seeing their purpose and value? If there was more emphasis and care in QA, in a true culture of quality assurance, the value would probably outweigh the costs. And what are those costs? So sometimes we uh, think of the fee for service, for example, that's very high, but we can't forget the person power that goes into these, the human resources and efforts put into these quality assurance activities can be very demanding and costly. The time and focus put into the preparation of the documents and evidence, planning and hosting, audits or reviews are not to be minimized and often are what sets smaller and larger institutions apart. The larger institutions with more hands on deck do not feel the shared responsibility as prominently as those institutions with maybe just one person responsible for quality assurance. In that case, the whole institution is at a halt while energies are spent on these QA audits. So Karen speaks of gaining new perspectives with O'Reilly, and I will share with you what she told me. I'm repeating her story, so if there's any questions about this later, I may not have all the answers, but you might have heard her tell this story if you were at the conference last year. Most people when selling a product or service focus on the cost value and assign price accordingly. This story offers a new way of thinking about this. So she told me about a company she had learned about in the Netherlands that sells custom-made sofas. It's a brilliant idea. Customers can select the shape and size of the sofa, the wood, the fabric, color, and all the bells and whistles. The company had made customer had many customers who would come in and sit with the designers for hours and create the perfect sofa for their space and taste. 
but the company wasn't selling them at the end of the day. People had their dream sofas designed, but they weren't buying them. They just couldn't close the deal. So the company's first reaction and approach was to add value. They provided more designer time, upscaled the fabric and wood, and provided more options of fabrics and colors and designs, but there weren't more sales. Their second approach was to ask the customer. Brilliant, isn't it? They were surprised to learn that one barrier to purchasing the sofa is that the customer didn't have a means to dispose of their existing sofa. So in some countries, this can be harder than in others. And in the Netherlands, it was too complicated. So instead of adding value, they removed obstacles, also known as removing friction. <laughs> we talk about it all the time. They started providing the service that they would remove the existing sofa upon delivery of the new one. Well, problem was solved and the sales went through the roof. So how can we apply this to QA? And what about quality assurance fees? And how much do we and do they believe the, in the power of quality assurance activities? Doesn't it all come back to return on investment? So also, why institutions with limited funds, why should they be excluded from these opportunities? If they don't have the resources to pay the fees, then what? So is it about getting a red seal to show off to the world or verifying quality assurance activities and continuous improvement? So is it about the flashy badge or student success in higher education? We at OCQAS are very fortunate in this. In Ontario, the institutions pay a membership fee for our service. So the cost of the fees isn't the same for every institution, it's proportionate. This membership fee covers our operations. So it covers the services, all of the services that we offer, including a scheduled audit. So having said that, we have seen over the years, the market become more competitive. And though our, our fees haven't gone up, the institutions are spending more time and resources preparing for the audit. And so this is causing creating financial and time and resource challenges for the, the auditees. So this got us thinking, and like, there's nothing we can do about the cost at this point. So how can we remove obstacles? So we focused on this at the next review. So we asked the institutions and many invested parties for their input and suggestions in removing the obstacles and in streamlining services. So I just wanna mention here that when we speak of streamlining services, we don't mean that making them easier or less robust. For us, it means being consumable and usable for the purpose of quality assurance. Even if streamlining means adding a requirement or a criteria that make the expectation clearer for the user. Our intent was then and is still today to take a close look at what is being done and consider all of the options. Is there a better way to do this? So we've developed a short and to the point training videos explaining the intent of most challenging requirements. And if you have a moment, find OCQAS on YouTube and take a look. They're cute and you'll see a cartoon of Karen and me. We have proposed QA books, which are a simpler version of the self-study. It's something that be, can be created by the college for their members that also serves to identify and meet the standards and requirements in our audit process. So we're also working with a group on this with biweekly meetings to get them going on their QA books to provide regular guidance so that they can develop these books. We've also started Q&A with QA, which is a one hour per week drop in question and answer session, we found out that many institutions would add up their questions until they had a few of them to, to then reach out to us. They didn't want to either reach out to us too much or, you know, to so that they wouldn't look disorganized or even worse, seem like they didn't know what they were doing. So these question and answer sessions, anyone can drop in and ask about any of our services. So we now even have regulars that drop in just to listen to other people's questions and get educated on quality assurance on a more regular basis. And so for us, it's an hour per week well spent. And finally, we also extended the audit cycles by one year. So we will be transitioning from auditing every five to six years, just to lessen the burden just a tiny bit. So we've endeavored to remove friction, but we don't know if it's enough. And we'll have to continue to gauge in quality assurance activities to verify the results. And in the meantime, we would love to hear how you're bringing value to the return on your QA investments in, in, your, in your areas and for your institutions. Thanks a lot. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Zoe. That was really interesting. I loved your 
I loved your story of the the sofas and it really is it's a smart way to to go about these problems some of our costs are fixed and it's really about how can we what other obstacles can we remove so I really appreciated that thank you so much I think we're going to turn to Ronnie next Ronnie would you um would you take the stage for us Perfect. Thank you, Mary Kat. And uh, yeah, already thanks to Sylvie, because I mean, some of the things that you were you were talking about, I really felt like, yeah, that's that's a great fit. And we're not too far apart to make it a bit easier for me to remember what I what I thought about uh, um, in 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 this uh, very quick introduction. I brought a couple of slides, three just to help me uh, remember uh, what I wanted to share. Let's hope. Um, that you are able to see it right now. Perfect. I hope you can see it. Um, yes, I see some nodding there, Cat. Well, that's great. There is there is probably one thing I want to mention before I uh, I, I share my three thoughts uh, that 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 I have on the question of efficiency and cost effectiveness. Um, and this is the question of the context. Uh, and I will not tell you a lot about my agency because this is like some of us, we know each other. There is one factor I think that that shapes a little bit my approach to how I think about cost efficiency. And that is the fact that the way the system that is my home system here in Germany is set up is it is a competitive system. That basically means we do have uh, numerous agencies that, that are allowed to operate in Germany and institutions are absolutely free to choose which, a, which agency they work with. And that, of course, is a very different setting than if, if you are in a setting where you have a regional or you have a national accreditor where every institution automatically has to work with. That shapes a lot about what is the relationship between institutions and an agency, but that also, personal opinion here, maybe shapes a little bit of the approach that we have to take when it comes to the question of efficiency of our services. So um, what are what 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 are my thoughts um when it comes to efficiency the first and i think this perfectly aligns with what sylvie was talking about when when she highlighted really the quality and i liked the way sylvie put it uh, not only talking about human resources but about human power that quality assurance brings to the table um so Quality assurance has a cost because we involve people um, and we bring lots of human power. Uh, I like that a lot to the table. And that basically means there is a minimum cost that, that is always involved um, in that. And if you want to start negotiating about this, then probably it will have an impact um, on quality and what is the outcome. Um, and at the same time, I think we as quality assurance providers need to be very good in explaining that and what added value we, we provide with our services. It is clearly not enough to basically say, for what reason ever you might be legally required to undergo a procedure, there needs to be something more coming out of it. There needs to be an added value, and that is something that is of benefit for the institution and, um, so to say, even of, of for the society. And this needs to be visible and this needs to be clear. What, what I see with some concern when I work in the European network uh, here and now is um, many QA agencies um, struggle with financial sustainability uh, here in Europe. Uh, so so when, I, when you look at their mission and, and what is our mission, and then you see the resources that go into it, uh, you, 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 this is really a good point where you can start wondering, like how, how many resources do we need to achieve the mission and how does that fit together? So, and, and there is an increased financial pressure um, on, on budgets, on public budgets. So there is an increased awareness and consciousness, but at the same time, um, we, we do see that very often quality assurance is seen as the easy solution to fix issues that are relevant uh, or that are challenging to higher education. So, so there is that that policy approach where you say, oh, we want we want this to happen in in the higher education sector. How do we get it done? Well, we put this on one of the standards for quality assurance. Then quality assurance has to has to deal with it. But of course, like the more you put on it, like like the more resources you need, or the more you have to ask the question, is this 
the right method that we're using. So efficiency is also uh, clearly de defined by what is the expectation of the outcome. Um, and this brings the, the key word of expectation. There is a minimum cost that, that will always be involved to provide a meaningful outcome. And I think we as quality assurance providers, we do also have to do some expectation management. We need to be very clear about what is something that we can contribute to, this, what is something where we can have an impact and what is clearly an, an, an area where we cannot have that? There is probably that's, I mean, there is a big debate currently in Europe about what is the future of the European standards and guidelines. Um, and that brings many expectations. And one of the things I think we have to be very good in is like do an expectation management. Second thought, um, I work in a competitive market and that brings many benefits, but it also has uh, some downsides because the fact that competition is there um, um, and I call it an external factor, it immediately brings um, some pressure and the need for efficiency. Because by the moment that you as an, as an agency are no longer efficient in the way you provide your services, um, the competition will clearly regulate it uh, and other players uh, will, will basically run the procedures. So while, while there is the factor where I think competition can be beneficial, uh, there is also the other aspect where I think sometimes even cooperation can increase the efficiency, particularly if you go on the cross cross border quality assurance. Um, there, I believe, like competing with whoever else is is the national regulator does not bring any added value. We really need to find ways of cooperation, of meaningful cooperation, because that will increase the efficiency. Um, and as well, uh, connected with competition. Uh, competition does not only have positive elements. Uh, there are risks that competition brings and it requires to a certain amount frameworks and a regulation because you can also compete um, on the back of quality and, and you can run a very, to, be, to put it nicely, a lean procedure, uh, which is the easy way out. Um, but but that is not what, what is good for the system. And that is not, I think, something that, that we should be interested in. And the last thing, and I think here we have to be a little bit of self-critical. Um, are we ready to be efficient? Um, quality assurance, and, and this is still very often the case, um, is, is very easy. We, we ask for additional evidence. We ask for, for, for something more. But we rarely ask, it was an Irish colleague who actually said like, we always add criteria, but we never we never get rid of criteria. Um, and we always ask for more evidence. And at the same time, th the question is like, do are we blocking efficiency by asking too much? So how safe, how, how much assurance do we need in the quality assurance? And where is the moment when, when we can say we do have good evidence and we can work on evidence-based trust? So that is like, bringing the issues of, of risk-based approaches. Uh, so, so how much do we have to ask? Um, and at the same time, um, most of us work with peer review processes. That, that's a very good um, and, and um, very efficient, let's say, let's say effective, or let's say accepted method um, of, of quality assurance. And sometimes we, we're, just, we're just not there when it comes to what is the right evidence, like what is the right balance of evidence that, that we ask and what is the amount of evidence that our peers can process. Uh, so this is, this is basically triggering a little bit the thought um, of, of asking ourselves, what are our methodological limitations and could sometimes less be actually more? Um, and that's basically uh, that, that's basically the three areas where I would say um, we at Aquas, being in Germany, but being being in Europe, um, these are the three dimensions where I would say like when we talk about efficiency of quality assurance of external quality assurance, that's the areas we're currently trying to navigate and 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 we have to deal with, um, and and now probably. Vicky has some thoughts of it, but I really look forward to the questions that will will come from the audience otherwise. And, and thanks a lot until here. Wonderful, thank you so much, Ronnie. That was really interesting. I loved your, your three major points were, were 
really on point. I think they're they're part of the major conversations that are that are happening in agencies around the world. Um, I know that in my agency, we definitely grappled with the the issue of increased number of standards and benchmarks and expectations on the institutions and on the programs that we're responsible for. And um, so it must have been about 2017 where we realized we'd had about you know sort of 17 years, 15 to 17 years of addition. And then we realized that um, that we needed to go on a benchmark diet. That was that was what we called it. And we just went through and we we sort of looked at what was critical, what wasn't critical, and we and we slimmed slimmed it down. So it was a it was an important process that we went through, and there was great appreciation from our stakeholders. So thank you for for uh, for your contribution, Ronnie and um, Vicky. I think we'll move to you next. Thanks very much, Mary Kath. I also have a few slides which I'm going to attempt to share. Um, let me just press play and then can you see the right thing, Mary Kath, or do I need to swap it over? I can. Right. Excellent. Good stuff. OK, so I just thought I'd run through something slightly different than the others. Um, and I'm afraid I'm looking now in the wrong direction because I'm looking at notes on a different screen, which for some reason my old lady incompetence means I can't quite move away from. So please bear with me. Um, but uh, QAA has been on a slightly different journey, I think, um, than, than we've heard from uh, Ronnie and from Sylvie uh, just now. Um, and I thought it might be interesting, if not helpful to talk you through some of that journey. So um, we used to be a very traditional um, compulsory uh, quality assurance agency and a model that many of you will recognise from your own environments. We were the only quality assurance agency in the UK. We remain the only quality assurance agency in the UK. So that, in that sense, we're not in a competitive environment in the way that Ronnie described. And yet, um, let me just talk through the sort of funding landscape, first of all. So what this slide shows you is that six years ago, only six years ago, it's very easy for us to forget that, QAA's income was more than 90% derived from government grants. We were funded on a statutory basis to undertake regulation across Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and England. And that accounted for more than 90% of our income. Um, we had a very small amount, less than 5% of our money that came from voluntary services to the domestic sector. And those were largely small pieces of consultancy that we did through a subsidiary body, largely subcontracting to individual experts um, and, and uh, behind sort of appropriate firewalls so that they didn't interfere with the statutory work that we were doing. Uh, and our statutory payments were for, in a pattern that many of you again will recognise, they were for a cyclical review process focusing predominantly on um, a little bit of quality assurance and a lot of continuous improvement, quality enhancement, helping the sector. It's a well-established sector with an extremely high reputation for quality, but helping it reflect on how it could get even better. And that process of review varied slightly from nation to nation. There are four nations within the UK. Each has a slightly different approach to quality assurance, but nonetheless, we ran those methods across all four of the nations. Um, and we also undertook um, th these fees uh, covered the work that we do in transnational education, in reporting on international environments, in enabling British universities to participate in transnational education. And it covered uh, the scrutiny of universities applying for degree awarding powers, so predominantly new entrants to the higher education market, um, and also some smaller pieces of regulatory work around access to higher education, widening participation, and educational oversight of independent providers. So we did a very similar thing, um, but subtly different, nuanced, for many different masters, funded compulsorily. And we thought life was difficult then, I have to say. I look back now, having joined in 2019, and laugh at the idea, frankly, that life was difficult then. Um, in 2018 in England, uh, we saw the beginning of the implementation of the Higher Education and Research Act, which was a piece of legislation that moved England away from co-regulation by peers and towards a risk-based proportionate regulatory framework under the auspices of a formal regulator. 
Um, and that was a very different approach. And I was really reflecting when Ronnie was talking about that point about finding the minimum um, resource that, that can deliver efficiency. At that point, because we were no longer the auditor in England effectively, we undertook a massive transformation exercise. And we went from being an, an agency of 150 plus individuals down to being an agency of about 60 people at one point. Um, and that really was uh, a recognition that our costs had to change in this new environment. We were still performing a limited function for the English regulator um, as the designated quality body. We were still performing our functions that were still funded by the Scottish, Welsh and Northern Irish government. But it was such a massive shift that we really did feel that we had to introduce a completely new business model and change our cost base. What we discovered in that was that a new business model is a very intense thing to, to deliver, to specify and to deliver, particularly quickly. And that 60 is below the level of minimum resource that you really need to be able to deliver an efficient, good value service. So over time, even as our grant income has come down and our voluntary income has grown, our cost base has had to grow in order to deliver that voluntary income. So that I thought, Ronnie, was an interesting um, point that you made there. Um, I think my speakers may have died. Can you hear me still? Yeah, OK, good. Um, so uh, the end of grant income um, came in England and that was the introduction of our voluntary membership model, which is a model I'll come back to in a moment. But that now meant that our work as the custodians of academic standards across the UK, so things like the UK Quality Code, things like the Frameworks for Higher Education Qualifications, um, things like the Credit Framework, Subject Benchmark Statements, all of those sorts of things, those were no longer compulsorily funded. And we had to find a mechanism for funding those. And that came through voluntary subscriptions in England. So um, as I say, Scotland, Ireland, um, and Wales continued to pay their grants, but in England it was a voluntary subscription and that had to demonstrate value for money. Um, and anywhere where you have to demonstrate value for money in a restricted funding environment, and let's face it, higher education is always a restricted funding environment, that is tricky. So in order to continue our standards work, we had to, we had to make sure that this voluntary membership model was compelling, that it demonstrated value. And between 2019 and 2023, what you can see here is that we continue to receive a certain amount of statutory funding through that designated quality body role, through our, our role in the nations. But in 2022-23, we demitted from the designated quality body role. And you can see that in 2023 onwards, those blue charts are much smaller than the, the orange bars. Um, and that means that over the past six years, we've moved from a position where we were more than 90% grant funded to a position where we are now more than 60% uh, reliant on self-generated income. Um, so, as I say, while we thought that life was complicated back in 2018, um, it's an awful lot more complicated now. The range of work that we undertake has become much broader. So our cost base Oh, I'm sorry, Vicky. We can't, we can't hear you. Sorry, uh, Vicky. Um. Oh, there you go. You're back. We lost you for a moment this voluntary there. Voluntary subscription model. Let me see if I can. move to a smaller screen and see what you're saying it's okay we can hear you we can hear you now we just lost your we lost your voice for a, for a moment there i can't hear you does that mean you can't hear me we can hear you okay I'm sorry good. if you can't hear us <laughs> fine sorry <laughs> okay good then so the opportunities that have come from taking control of our own trajectory, becoming a more commercial body. We are now in control of what our core activities are. We can design those activities for ourselves. We're not at the whim of um, a, a government or a regulatory or a funding body to tell us what we need to do. It took a little while to find our feet there because the voluntary membership model was not only new to us, but new to the sector. But actually, I have to say the pandemic was really helpful in helping us establish that. It meant that we were remaining, we, we, we remained essential for giving the sector guidance 
and it gave us exposure with government and with policy makers. Um, it allowed us to demonstrate in a moment of crisis our convening power as between regulators, government and the statutory regulatory bodies in the professions. Um, and, and it allowed us to demonstrate our expertise in areas such as online delivery, where really there were very few bodies that had the kind of quality expertise that was needed. Um, and we were able to bring people together to talk about how to resolve problems that the pandemic threw up. Um, we are no longer at the whim of changes by the regulator to, to a huge extent. So that 60% of our income that's self-governing is completely protected from the, the kind of changes in the regulatory framework. But we can never underestimate the importance of the 40%. And there are significant programmes of reform happening at the moment in Scotland and Wales. Of course, we still have to be responsive to those. So in some senses, we're running two parallel business models here. We have the um, model of a large state agency um, doing the behest of a regulatory funding body. Um, and then we have the competitive agency that Ronnie describes. We're very much operating in a hybrid mode at the moment. Um, and it gives us this, this, this um, uh, independent element of our income, gives us the chance to access new markets um, and provide greater targeted support to the sector. So we've been able to take our expertise as a regulatory body and turn that around to support the sector as it finds its feet in a new regulatory environment in England. Um, we're able still to support government policy around the export of higher education and around particular thorny problems that don't necessarily fall under the remit of the regulator. Um, and we're able to be more frank about the impact of policy and rhetoric when we talk publicly. So although we have always been an independent agency um, and we've always been very much of uh, independent opinion, the fact that we're no longer reliant on governing government funding allows us to be much more explicit about some of the ways in which policy in England is not necessarily um, helpful to the sector as such. Um, and it can help us with regulatory concerns, even though in England we now have no regulatory authority. There are um, issues that universities face um, and new systems where our expertise is helpful. One of the issues, for example, is that the, the new English regulatory system doesn't do cyclical review. And so for those providers who do have significant presences internationally, we're able to offer support in giving them an accreditation against international benchmarks that allows them to demonstrate to their international partners the ongoing quality of their provision in a way that satisfies the partner's due diligence requirements. But there are challenges. Um, and I think these are largely self-explanatory. I'm a little nervous about running out of time, so I won't go on for too long about them. But one of the challenges, as Ronnie and indeed um, uh, uh, the others have talked about, is, is the central support costs. We need to have the human capital, the human resource and the human expertise to deliver a whole raft of products now. It's not simply one thing done with different nuances. It's a range of very different things. Um, and none of those things can be done um, by people who don't have considerable expertise and experience. Our resourcing model, our human um, capital, is largely swayed towards people um, with quite a considerable amount of career experience, both in and outside academia. Um, and so that's an expensive investment for us. But everything that we do has to wash its face. Um, and obviously that means that pricing can be difficult. Um, we have also to balance um, a conflict of interest uh, concern. Um, and that is um, part of the role that we do uh, in supporting people with regulatory concerns, um, while we still hold a regulatory function in other parts of the nation, we have to be very careful to be seen to maintain thorough firewalls and independence on separation of our activities so that there is no conflict there. And we have had um, to think very carefully around resource planning, around persuading our board that actually as a more commercial um, entity, they now need to give us permission to invest in order to grow our business, which means the board has had to get comfortable with the idea that new products may not break even immediately. And this is a big difference for a board that has been a traditional non-profit into a board that is now becoming a much more commercially focused organisation. That has been quite an issue. And the other, the other um, 
uh, kind of statutory problem that we have is that we're also a charity. And in England, what that means is that while we're allowed to retain enough funds to maintain our own sustainability, we're not allowed to make a profit. Um, now, that's a good thing in terms of us being able to say to the sector, we're not profiteering from the advice that we give you. But it does um, make it difficult uh, to, to kind of position those new products so that there is um, enough kind of ramp time for them to take off um, and not worry our board too much. And all of this has had to be delivered in a sector in England that's under huge financial pressure. So this is now looking at the sector, not at the agency. Um, there are enormous financial threats and opportunities across universities that are incredibly complex and interlinked. And so we have to be able to justify to our members what the value we bring them is and why in this increasingly difficult and competitive environment, they should continue to pay our membership fee for which there is no imperative. They're not statutorily obliged to do it. They can choose from year to year whether they continue to subscribe or not. So actually demonstrating our value, removing the friction from that decision um, makes it easier for them to, to justify the decision and for us to be sure that we can carry on operating this model. I'll stop there, thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you so much, Vicky. Are you able to hear me? Okay, well, hope, okay, everyone else can hear me, but hopefully Vicky will be able to, to hear and, uh, and participate in the next, in the next session, uh, section of our session, which is um, a few, a few questions just to, to draw out some of the key elements of these presentations that we've had. They really have been so insightful thinking about what the, uh, what the value of quality assurance is both for a regulatory purpose, as well as a voluntary quality enhancement activity. Um, the competitive landscape, as well as um, as well as issues of a changing business model and what and what that entails for the cost benefit analysis of activities. Um, so our our first question really has to deal with context. Maybe Ronnie, you might you might start us off and and just share how context matters. In in your context, you've you've shared that it is a competitive market. So how can you understand the opportunities for cost effectiveness and efficiency given that environment? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Marika. That's a, that's a really excellent question because I'm, I, I strongly believe that it like the, the opportunities really depend on the individual situation, on context. So so for example, in, in my agencies, uh, in, in my agency, what, what, what I think is a, is a real area of debate that is defined by our context. Um, is is for example, and Roto Roto wrote wrote a question going this into the into the Q and A as well. Is uh, is the combination of different programs or or a diff at a higher number of programs into one review and making it a cluster review? And that is that is um, uh, it is an increase of of efficiency, of course, uh, but of course it brings new challenges. And and you do see like institutions with a tendency to ask for more programs to be combined. Well, then, of course, we as accreditors, we need to bring to the table that there are limitations on the methodology, and there is only so much that you can do. Um, so this is this is a this is a very practical, I would even say, almost everyday example uh, when we really need to see like how how much of 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 efficiency can we create in a procedure, um, and there is really different interests in the market. And uh, the, the second area, I think that that and this is probably not so much. Uh, something that is only coming to us um following the pandemic one of the very big discussions about efficiency we had is like do we still need site visits because everything went online everything went virtual and we do actually have we, we did have uh, uh operations in a country where they said and we will always stick to the fully virtual model um, because that saves a lot of, of travel that saves a lot of resources it's way more green but then you also need to see what is the impact of that and 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 how much of a difference it makes if you only bring people together in a virtual format than if you bring them really to to a site visit and and the experts feel uh, how quality is lived or where there is a need for improvement and so i think this is this is something that uh, clearly with uh, with regards to uh, efficiency will remain an ongoing discussion that we have uh, to what extent do we need it because you want to save resources but you still want an equally trustworthy 
outcome and you want to create an added value. And for that, I think it makes a big difference. For the added value, it makes a big, big difference um, if you are on site or if you're not on site. I think that's the two things I would want to highlight uh, quite spontaneously on how context matters in, in the questions of efficiency. Thanks, thanks so much, Ronnie. Absolutely, the the virtual versus in 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 person site visit is something that a lot of agencies have contended with, and um, decisions are are still are still ma being made on a on a daily basis. Um, maybe we can turn to Sylvie next. Sylvie, what are your thoughts on on context and how it impacts efficiencies? And um, uh, yeah, please. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ronnie, you said it so well about the efficiencies of virtual site visits because it's definitely something that we benefit from uh, financially for the efficiency of it. Not only that, but we really do also appreciate having the people on screen so that you have the person's face, you have the person's name, you can you can easily refer to each individual and know, oh, your this student is studying in this program and so on. So it makes things a lot, there's benefits to it. It's not just cost efficient, it's also, um, you know, human expenditure efficient because you, you put a little less effort in trying to figure out who people are and what they're doing. It's right there on the screen in front of you. So that does help as well. But our auditors definitely tell us how much they miss that feeling of, can we feel how this quality assurance is lived in, in the colleges? For our context, uh, we don't struggle with financial sustainability because we're, you know, membership paid. All the colleges pay into us. However, this is okay for status quo. So a lot where Vicky was talking about, you know, considering other options and other services and how we can grow and and make certain efficiencies by being bigger and and helping more more people um, understand the context of quality assurance is more limiting. And so for a long time, Karen was all by herself. She was the only employee of uh, OCQAS and she would be supported by secondees from colleges. Recently, a few years ago, I came on and uh, so now we're two employees at Ontario College Quality Assurance Service. And so this, it makes that uh, the time that we can spend is very limited on each each audit, so the processes have to be very tight and and limited, so that everybody gets the same amount of attention. Everybody, every institution is is served exactly the, in the same way, and so we find that the only piece missing for this efficiency is really education, because of again the large rollover in the in this type of job in the institutions, we're constantly re-educating people. And it feels like we're reselling the value of quality assurance time after time until people get the hang of it and get the hang of that continuous improvement, that verification loop, that continuous um, involvement of, of the people, you know, the invested parties that uh, have add that you are working towards their success, right? So that the students, the student success in the higher education. So those are a few things that are in our context right now in our thoughts. <laughs> Thanks. Great, thank you. And Vicki, I, I can appreciate that in your context, you probably think about opportunities for cost-effectiveness and efficiency daily. Um, <laughs> love, love to hear your thoughts on this. I'm going to take a slightly different angle on this question, actually, Mary Kath. We we do think, obviously, a lot about internal efficiencies in, in much the same ways that Ronnie and Sylvia just described. So rather than give you a kind of me too answer, um, we also think about the efficiency that we bring to the system. Mm -hmm. And this is a big part of selling our value, actually, because nobody has to belong to us in England. Yeah. But one of the real benefits, I think, is that we offer them efficiencies in their own system. We offer them a translational efficiency and that we can help them understand and navigate a regulatory system that is only five years old. It's still quite new to them. Um, so we can help people, particularly those people who have um, very small resources themselves. We can help them discover how to navigate and demonstrate their compliance to that. We can offer efficiencies in staff development, in saving time and resource. Now, one of the things about the English system that's really interesting is that it's gone from a kind of uh, cyclical review based something like an audit system, where there was within providers a heavy investment in quality offices and people who did internal quality review and internal quality assurance. 
the English system has now become very data driven. And we suspect, we don't yet have full amount of data ourselves, but we suspect that there has been a commensurate shift in investment within providers from quality offices to data specialists. And that means that there is um, a lot of work for us to do, both in helping people learn how to navigate data quality and how to interpret data quality, but also to think about how you continue those programs of continuous improvement and how you continue to demonstrate both your commitment to and your ongoing practice of quality externally when there isn't a regulator looking at it. And I think that, that the fact that there is a central body doing that, maintaining the academic standards, describing what continuous improvement in quality of provision looks like, is a considerable efficiency in the system. It means people can focus on what their own strategy and missions require them to without actually losing the gains that they have made over in this quality area in the past few years. We can also, we're, we're really uniquely placed because of the way the UK works to extrapolate learning across all four of the nations and to highlight that learning to the three who haven't actually experienced it, right? So um, an interesting example I would give you there is the Welsh and Scottish reforms that I talked about. Both of those countries in slightly different ways are expanding their higher education, regulation and quality systems to include tertiary education. So anything after post compulsory education is being included in slightly different ways in Scotland and Wales. And because we've been instrumental in both of those processes, we're able to share learnings across the two. Um, and we're also able to bring those learnings into England while England thinks about its lifelong learning environment and how it's going to deliver against a lifelong learning loan entitlement. Mm -hmm. um, and that I think, again, means that other people don't have to resource up to repeat the learning and to repeat the exercises that we've already done. And we can kind of generalize those links across various pieces. We have an efficiency and convening powers and so on and so forth. I think that's the real way that we think about efficiency most at the moment. Um, and it's it's a real kind of demonstration, both of how we remove friction and of how we add value to people within the sector. That's great, Vicky. Thank you so much for that for that insight and, and making sure that efficiencies is being sort of translated into the institutions which we're which we're trying to serve. And I think that really ties in nicely to the next question, which is how do you work with stakeholders in your context? How are you ensuring that the decisions that you make in your quality assurance agency are supporting the needs of your institutions, of your programs, of your governments in, in the situation where you know you're not beholden to them, but are partners in quality with them? Um, how about how about we start maybe back with you, Vicky? I mean, that's an interesting question because the nature of partnership changes over time, right? <laughs> um, so how do we work with stakeholders? We used to be very traditional about it. We used to work through a series of stakeholder surveys, what was on people's minds and so on and so forth. Um, but I felt very much that when we were introducing the new membership business model, it was no longer to appropriate to go to people and say, oh, hi, we're your expert body. What do you want us to do? Um, we needed to be able to, to, to kind of convey that authority and expertise um, in delivering our membership program. So how do we work with our stakeholders? Well, we do it in a number of ways. We do it um, directly by convening different networks we're, we're very aware now that as part of our value proposition we need to have links into providers at various different levels so at the strategic level i will talk to vice chancellors we have networks of pro vice chancellors for education for international for various other groups um, and we bring those together um, to share expertise to share concerns to talk through policy issues to think about implementation of advice and recommendations um, we also link directly into quality offices um, and we help people with the implementation of quality um, and standards uh, in, in a way that's particular to their own context and practices. Um, but we talk to government on an advisory basis. We talk to funders and regulators on an advisory basis. We're a key part of the English Quality Council, which brings together the four nations, um, funding and regulatory bodies, various sector bodies, mission groups and students to think about issues uh, pertaining to quality across the nations. Um, and we work with um, students on an advisory basis. Actually, we work with students 
still very much at the core of everything that we do. We have a student advisory body so that we haven't lost that student voice as we've moved out of a traditional assessment and into a more kind of um, advisory collegiate working relationship with the sector. So we have various ways for people to contact us and we found that's incredibly efficient actually. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you do quite a, quite a bit of, of outreach. Um, maybe I'll turn to Sylvie next to share with us what sort of stakeholder engagement you, you engage with. So obviously our types of agencies have to communicate with a lot of people more on a need to basis, sometimes on an inter interest basis as well. But what we do that's maybe a little bit more productive for us is engage uh, working groups. So we identify issues that we would like to address or challenges that have been identified by our institutions. And we create working groups around these issues and questions. And if, if it takes you know three working groups, it takes three. And if it takes the whole year, it takes the whole year. So we, we sit down with, a, and it can be one represented, one represented from ed, every education if need be. Usually we have a, a dozen or so, so about half of the institutions participate on one topic. And we, we kind of hash it out, ask all the questions and get all of the input on, on opinions. Sometimes it, we, it grows, so we include other uh, invested parties as well to join our conversation so that we really understand what the challenges are and we this is how we address these challenges. So we were able to fix some wording in our requirements this way or just maybe realize that the intent of the requirement wasn't properly understood by the, the in institutions. And so these are why these videos came out were to clarify the intent of the requirement, for example. And the other means that we use that's a little different are these Q&A sessions that we started because people come in with questions and you didn't realize people were wondering this. It's like, oh, you know, this is kind of a an informal place where you can just ask any questions. And we're thinking, oh, we thought people were very aware of this. And so it makes us aware of what you don't know what you don't know. And so when we engage with the people on this level, we get to really understand their thought process, their perspectives, and, you know, the sometimes really basic things that we forget to remind people of or to engage people with. And so those are maybe some of the differences that we work with. Well, that's great. Thank you so much. Yeah, working working directly with the institutions and in the development and the practice of the quality assurance mechanisms is is really important. Thank you. Ronnie, what about you? You want to tell us a little bit about your thoughts? Yeah, sure. And and, and like it's interesting just to see like like uh, there is there is a kind of an alignment uh, independent from the context because it's it's very obvious that stakeholders are key. Um and 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 exchanging and and listening to stakeholders is is key. And I I would want to highlight probably like it's listening. And it's a continuous process. So, and and the way I would clearly say, like we we listen to our stakeholders, is a very active way of listening and also identifying that we have lots of contact with stakeholders, even in our procedures. Like like uh, we always have one of us joining, for example, if we travel with panels. And there is lots of things that they go to have dinner together, and then our peers talk about what what drives them in in when they work in their institutions. So so when you basically the, the one thing is you have all the formal the formal things that formal ways of interaction, where you evaluate, you ask the universities, you talk to to to, to you work with, um um and and you have all these formal elements, but I think there is lots of relevance to being a good listener. And being a good listener about what is going on in the field, about what are the needs. Um, and like one of the issues, one of the things, for example, we 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 are about like in in a process of working on is is uh, we we have an institutional review process. It's a voluntary process. Um, and and the, the the level of satisfaction of the universities that work with us is quite high. But what we learned is because it's a voluntary ex experience, um, like they like they 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 think they they are for the whole accreditation period they feel a little bit of 
they want some support and they want they want some some wind under their wings i i would say um, and th that is the outcome of a very interesting process that basically started through a conversation of of two of of two universities of two rectors uh, that 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 were accredited by us and we were just listening and and from that sentiment that they raised we recognized that this is something that we need to address so they never came to us and say we want something from you or we need something from you but there was a clear need in the field where there was a need to support and enhance and and provide better services and then and i think this is of course more on on the formal side but it's really relevant like students uh, like listening to what students want we do have um, like in germany there is a self-organized student pool um, and and it's very good that this is self-organized uh, because they have different priorities um, but we do actively support them we do exchange with them uh, so that we also do not only communicate our needs <laughs> but but there is also the channel of of listening what are the students needs in that because that always requires a little bit of extra attention i think if there isn't if if the higher education sector if universities have a concern they always find a very easy way <laughs> to raise their voice uh, but that is not the same for for every stakeholder group um, and so i would clearly say what matters is it's a continuous process um, and, and you need to have very, very open ears uh, continuously uh, to, to listen what the stakeholders say and not even what they say to you, but what, what, what they basically move in the sector. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Thank you all for your, for your insights on how stakeholders are being engaged in the activities that you do to ensure that your practice is um, is serving their needs. There's a question. I think we're going to start to open it up to uh, to audience questions. And we have one that sort of directly follows on, on our just recent question about stakeholders. And this one is, how do you see the role of experts, including industry, students, in, and international in efficiency and cost effectiveness? Um, who would like to start with this one? Do I have a volunteer or can I... Ronnie, you look like you're you're still you're still ready to go. <laughs> well, this is an excellent question, but uh, but it depends on how how you see it. And I I think um, the different stakeholders, the different experts, because the experts also represent different stakeholders, they do have different needs, and if we want them to be effective in the procedure, we really need to efficiently facilitate their work and that basically means we need to be very aware of the different needs that they have so for example if you have if you work with you have academics in the in the process like usually we, we mix the groups but you have academics who do like it's 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 rarely their first review they, they know they know the field they know how a university is run they know how a program is run and they also know where are the internal challenges in faculties and the departments if you bring someone from industry that person might not know all this uh, that person might also have a very different approach towards the whole sphere of what we are exposing them to and that's exactly the reason why we expose them and why we bring them um, because we want their input but they need a little bit of a different preparation they need uh, if i think about the practicalities um, if, if you have a panel of five people and you have one student in it and it's the first time the student does it this student has very different needs there is there is uh, like preparation that training needs because for us every expert is exactly the same and that also means the student is allowed to ask every question if it's the quality of the curriculum if there is a concern and the role and the contribution for the final report is exactly the same and that's of course something that's a responsibility and we need we need everyone to be fit to deal with that and that means that we need to look at the stakeholders and the different stakeholders and, and experts differently and empower them and make sure that that we once they are experts that they're that they're fit and that they feel comfortable in supporting the process and in, in in the end also having having a positive experience where they feel that they can contribute thank you thank you for that it, it is it's a major undertaking to ensure that the the panel members the experts are suitably prepared for the task and that does require investment um sylvie do you want to speak to that that issue next yes i would love to 
So we, we have in our processes some, the uh, institutions are mandated to have a program advisory committee for each program that they offer. And so you can cluster these program advisory committees, but for the most part, there's involvement with expert uh, invested parties constantly in the programs. And our quality assurance processes verify that they're using these experts in the way that they're meant to be used so that the experts are being oriented and invited to participate on multiple levels for each program. And so this involves these industry experts on a very regular basis for every program offered at these institutions. And this is part of our quality assurance process to not only help the college better use these industry experts, we can help with training and education, but also to verify that the industry experts are really using to keep the programs current and relevant for our institutions and for student success. Our agency also obviously uses external experts such as Inquahi and other agencies that we really rely on to you know, get a, a larger perspective so that we can grow as well. Uh, one of the most recent uh, growth that we were looking for with uh, how, how well the um, UK is doing this is, is a student engagement, you know? And so we, we are, our growth also depends a lot on agencies uh, such as these so that we can better than educate our in you know institutions in our area. Great. Thank you so much, Sylvie. Vicky, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I'm going to think about it from a slightly different angle, I think, maybe. Um, and that is uh <laughs> it doesn't help if you're giggling at me, Ronnie. <laughs> One of the things that we do, um, because obviously the the, the um, regulatory system in England is now so different. So in the kind of voluntary space, um, we uh, try to help universities, as I've said, to maintain their, their commitment to continuous improvement. And that means that every once in a while we refresh some of the standards. Um, so things like the credit framework, um, looking at how credit is comprised, things like the subject benchmark statements and so on. Now, the, the, the regulatory system has become increasingly complex in some senses. So the main regulator is, is in many ways much simpler. They have a minimum standard that providers have to reach and, and how they reach that is entirely up to them. There's no kind of stipulation. There's no, nothing mandatory. It's for each governing body at each university to decide for themselves how they meet the standards stipulated by the regulator. But because there is a minimum standards and because the reputation of UKHE is what it is, universities are committed to doing a great deal beyond that. Some of the ways that we support that are in things like subject benchmark statements. There's no national curriculum. These are not things that prescribe what must be taught, but they are descriptors of what a graduate in any discipline at any level should be able to do and to demonstrate at the point of graduation. Now, a lot of subjects, as well as having the statutory regulation, have input from other regulators, professional regulators or professional practice bodies. Um, and the onus of trying to satisfy the apparently less complex requirements of a regulator who gives them great freedom in deciding how they stipulate versus, for example, um, the regulator of the medical professional bodies who has, for obvious reasons, far less freedom around deciding what, an, what a graduate should be able to do. That could be a tension that might be very variably resolved as between different medical schools, for example. So what we do when we bring together those subject benchmark statements is form a working group of practice that comprises academics, students, recently retired academics, professional regulators and practitioners in the field. And they will look at how the academic subject has evolved since the last time the, the, the statement was refreshed. It's typically a seven year cycle. So what are the new things people are thinking about? Um, how should those or indeed should those be incorporated into the subject benchmark statements? And it's this expert group that will then recommend the changes. So while QAA owns the statements they, and we hold the pen on the statements and we own the intellectual property in the statements, it's actually a group of experts who write the statements and it's a different group of experts each time. 
So in that way, the sort of standards around academic practice and continuous improvement are informed by stakeholders who have real skin in the game and real authority and credibility in the system. And I think that's a very good use of expertise because it shows providers I mean, it helps reconcile some of the tensions in providing that subject with such a wide stakeholder group with very different kind of impacts um, and, and helps them navigate any tension that there might be in the kind of regulatory or accreditation field um, within each subject. That's great, Vicky. Thank you so much. And it was a different slant, and I really appreciated that insight um, that you that you brought. Um, I'm going to ask another question from our audience here. One of the earlier questions that we had uh, from an anonymous participant says, senior leaders view quality assurance as a necessity in higher education institutions. However, there are agencies that become a tick box or just a badge rather than providing added value to the institution how would quality assurance agencies address this emerging sentiment? Um, perhaps we can start with Sylvie. Yes, thank you. I think I alluded to that a little bit in my initial presentation mm -hmm. where how do we how do we convince and you know it's like a sales game how do we convince of the the return on investment for quality assurance and i think that there are definitely ticky boxes and and maybe it would be great to see the all of the accreditation and quality assurance agencies work together so that there isn't so much repetition in what what is requested and what is ask and it's asked in a different little nuance from this accreditation body or this agency and so you can't just you know copy and paste your answer from one uh, from one self study to the next which, which is you know uh, extra work and again um person power uh, required for uh, you know meeting these requirements and it would be so interesting to have more of a these conversations with all of the bodies so that that there would be you know maybe less ticky boxes for those programs that really need it so the programs that really need those health related programs that need to be accredited so that we ensure the quality of the student coming out and the in in contra and in, in contradiction with the programs that maybe need the program to be very quality assured, but don't necessarily need to ask all the institutional questions. You know, So if the institution is quality assured through an, another body, maybe they can focus on the program instead of focusing on all of the operations of the institution and things like that. So these conversations are very important. I don't have any answers as to how to best maneuver them, but I definitely think that there are there should be means to reduce the ticky boxes and and the the flashy badges so that these are purposeful activities that people want to quality assure and want to verify their processes so that everybody wins in the end. That's great, thank you. Um, maybe we'll turn to Ronnie next. I'll try to give a probably not so popular answer. Um. I, I believe um, that quality assurance needs to create added value. Um, and and we need to bring something to the table. And with our services, we need to support an institution in development. Vicky, like a couple of, like in, in I think it's in the initial statement, connected uh, the outcomes of quality assurance with the strategic development of an institution. Um, and I would wonder, it's like, how simple can an institution be if with a report that was just ticking boxes, they can benefit in their strategic development? Um, I think I think the, the, the reason why this is becoming popular is because you have institutions who go the easy way and to ask for exactly this. Um, and I can I can totally understand that. If for legal reasons you have to undergo it, there might be a very good motivation to basically say, we look for the easiest way to achieve what we have to do. That's also connected with cost effectiveness and efficiency. If you have to do it and you're getting the same outcome in different ways, you look for the most efficient way to do it. And if ticking, ticking boxes uh, serves the purpose, then this is what you do for. So I totally, uh, I totally see it. However, um, if 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 you do have methods um, and, and methodologies in place 
that can create an added value and, and, and support strategic development on program level, on, on institutional level, um, then probably you can have a qualitative um, debate and you can also have an outcome that is definitely not achieved with just ticking boxes. So I, I'm very skeptical that, that by ticking boxes, you can create that added value because then over time, you know, oh yes, like five years ago, we were at 4.6 on that scale. Now we are at 4.8 and I wouldn't know what the, what's the difference. Um, and, 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 and the ticking boxes do not tell you what you have to do to come from 4.6 to 2.8. So that, that needs to go beyond this. And I think this is exactly what quality assurance in the end has to provide because we need to support. And yes, for one part, we're very clear, it, it is compliance. Um, and that basically means you're there, you're not there. That That is something where you can put the stamp on it. But to go beyond that, um, I think, and this is this is what we need to achieve, um, ticking boxes is is a little bit of, um, of, of not the most helpful way, at least. Um, and so I would always challenge um, the, the, the institutions who basically ask for it and to, to, to go down that way. Because to a certain extent, um, the, all, all of the things that you hear about, quality assurance is so time consuming and, and it's so expensive, we have to invest so much and we get so little out of that. That's exactly, that's exactly because of, you know, you have to do it anyway. Why not do it in a way that you get something out of it, which is really meaningful. So, so I know this is not very popular to say, but, but, but here it is like, you, by, by doing it, you basically su support the, the criticism that, that, that you have against it. I think that's, I think that's a fair comment to make. It really is about the institutional investment in the process, which will determine the, the outcome, the value that they get from it and, um, and change from a tick box to, um, to a value add experience. Vicky, do you have thoughts on this? I, I might be about to be even more unpopular then, um, because I, and not only do I agree with Ronnie, but I would go further. So I'm, I'm going to go to the hardcore punk of unpopularity here. Um, I, think, I think that the point of quality assurance, as Ronnie says, is to add value. Um, and, and a quality assurance review does need to demonstrate compliance. Let's not lose sight of that. But it needs to do so much more than that. So... I think it's important that as a provider, as an institution, you can demonstrate that you have a fair admissions policy. I think it's important that you can demonstrate you have a process for assessment and feedback and all of that. In a sense, though, I'm going to be quite radical here. It doesn't matter a jot how many processes and policies you've got if your students aren't thriving, if they're not succeeding. What really matters is that your students are doing well in a system that's recognized to be excellent and enables them to progress in their careers in a way that's meaningful. And, and so what I'm really interested in from quality assurance is not just, do you have a process? Do you have a policy? Do you implement it? Show me the minutes. I'm interested in, do you look at your students' outcomes? Do you understand your students' outcomes? What are they? How do you get them? Show me that you understand how you get them. Show me that you understand that in a way that makes it repeatable. And show me what you do when they don't work in the way that you planned. And if you can do all of those things, and those things should, hopefully, in an ideal world, align with your policies and processes. But if they don't, I think it's more important that you're doing the things than that you have the documents that describe the things. And I would want you to move towards alignment, for sure. But what's really important is that you understand the outcomes you're producing for your students, how you got there and how you're going to get there again and how you're going to make it better over time. And I don't think you can do that with a tick box at all. Yeah, I think that's really insightful, Vicky. I, I couldn't agree more that outcomes based, evidence based um, evaluations really are what we should all be striving for, because just because it's written down on a piece of paper doesn't actually mean that it is integrated into the ethos of an institution or a program. So, so thank you for those insights. I do appreciate them. Now, I'm going to um, I'm going to ask a question that I think builds off of the the last one about stakeholder engagement. 
And it comes from a, a comment that Sylvie made about working with um, other agencies. There, there are a huge number of professional accreditation bodies, and there are a huge number of government level sort of broad, broad based quality assurance agencies, and there are overlapping components. And I think some of the burnout that comes from the institutions when they do just treat it as a checkbox activity is because they've just done it. And it's similar information, but they want, but it needs to be presented differently. Or, you know, they're they're being asked to change this by one organization. And then, you know, the next year, someone else looks and makes other recommendations. So my question to you as agencies, do you and how do you work with other agencies to maybe simplify the processes for or the and the, the activities for the institutions because I think there's an efficiency component that that we haven't haven't yet addressed in our conversation who would like to to begin with this one Shall Vicky, I kick off? please <laughs> okay so so in the UK, we're helped by something called the Regulators Code, which says that where there's more than one regulatory interest in a sector, then the um, participants in that sector should be encouraged to be able to um, produce a document once and then use it many times to satisfy the requirements of the different regulators. Now, that's an imprecise science and it doesn't always work perfectly. But um, we, we try to facilitate that process by building relationships with the with the regulatory bodies that work across the piece um, and by trying to understand where the tensions and clashes lie and use our convening power built up over many years to try to negotiate resolutions to those tensions and clashes. And in doing that, we've learned some interesting things. So. Um, professional statutory regulatory bodies, people like the General Medical Council, the Solicitors Regulatory Council, the dentists, whatever they're called, um, fall into various different categories. There are those, like the ones I've just mentioned, who have a very understandable fitness to practice. The, the, the consequences of failure for their practitioners are comparatively high, whereas, I'm going to make someone up now, the um, Horticultural Guild, for example, the consequences of failure there considerably lower. Um, and so the, the, the impetuses and the drivers for them are very, very different. And yet, and yet, um, they will both want to see students in their discipline um, adhering to a sort of programme that fulfils their requirements for qualification into their professional body. Um, and sometimes those requirements can seem to be conflicting, conflictual, um, difficult to reconcile. Um, and I think there, there's a, a, a sort of perception that the professions are more conservative than the learning institutions, and that they can sometimes act as a break on development of pe pedagogy and practice and assessment. Um, and one of the things we found really interesting is that that isn't always so. That, and quite often what happens is that you've got a faculty who are more or less in burnout, overwhelmed by you know, the fallout from the pandemic and supporting their students and their well-being and mental health and all the various different things that faculty have to do these days. And um, when somebody says in their um, course approval process, oh, well, what we really need now is authentic assessment. Let's do all our assessment through the medium of expressive dance, for example, the faculty will say, oh, we can't possibly do that. The PSRB would never agree to it because that is a safety net for them. They can pass that off on some living authority who seem to be able to be a drop dead no um, and, and hit it back up the, up the um, hill again. Um, and a lot of what we do is to try to reconcile those tensions and make people understand that sometimes the demands of progress are not necessarily reasonable for overloaded people. Um, and I've slightly lost track of the question here, but I think I think that's that those sorts of convening discussions and helping people understand the knotty problems at the heart of obstacles to process and progress um, are the ways that we can really add value and help smooth things over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Working working together when you find that that pinnacle to to address. 
Ronnie, maybe you could you could speak to this question of collaboration. Yeah, yeah, and I'll um I'll probably I'll I'll give two different answers because uh, what what we do um, when we when we operate here in Germany, um there there are various fields where you have very strong regulations. Like we are a very strong agency in teacher education, for example, and teacher education is incredibly complicated because Germany for the outside looks so easy to, to, to look at, but we're 16 federal states. And that basically means we have 16 different federal laws addressing teacher education. Um, and, uh, and we do lots of procedures in that. Um, and the easiest way is we do involve uh, like like uh, the, the ministries, like the representation, not the, directly the ministries, but those who basically regulate teacher education in the process. So so in our expert panel, um, like one of the regulators um, is, is part of the review um, and in the end basically has to confirm that also these requirements are met, otherwise they cannot succeed. Um, that is that is basically in a different, a different format, um, like for for ecclesiastic studies, so whenever religion is is is, is addressed, uh, like like also we do not not exactly in the same way as in teacher education, we do involve like like representation of the churches, sometimes even just in written form, but but that goes there. So in so, so to achieve that that within one review we can look at both different uh, like requirements, knowing that the institutions beforehand. Uh, like probably have a longer dialogue with the regulator themselves, and when we come, you you look at at the outcome. It looks a bit different because we do also have um, uh, some cross border activities, and there I think this is a super interesting um, um, element. Um, the on the European landscape, even our our framework, the European standards and guidelines, request that basically you are in good term when you operate when you operate out of uh, of your home. Um, of your of your home uh, country, um, but that is that is pretty much what what we try to implement uh, wherever we go. We reach out to the national accreditor, um, and and we try to get a better understanding, and we try to be in good terms with them, so that that there is the, the first level is exchange of information. Who are we? What we're doing? Second level is then looking at what are the requirements, because we also need to understand what are the requirements that that the institution or a program has to fulfill in order to particularly avoid repetition. Next level then, and this is really where it starts getting interesting, but also um, complicated, is when you basically join forces and when you want to have joint procedures. Uh, we've done that a lot uh, in Europe in, in part of developing the, Euro the European higher education area for joint programs where basically you needed to have um, like um, different um, bodies involved. Um, but But to me, this is like, a really positive opportunity also to 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 work with um with colleagues from other countries from other from other contexts because that's that kind of spirit of cooperation I, I was talking a lot about uh, competition beforehand, but I'm a big fan of cooperating with other bodies because it it also creates lots of mutual learning. And by dealing and by by looking at how other countries, how other colleagues are doing something, you can take a lot of things back home and question yourself, why are we doing this in such an inefficient way here? Uh, we can learn from the others. So that would be the, the, the two answers. So they're clearly... Um, this is about joining forces uh, to avoid um, like double work for an institution. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. We are kind of at time, but Sylvia, I'd love I'd love to hear your last word on on this topic about collaboration. And I will just have to admit, I love the fact that you know all of our talk about efficiencies and cost pressures, we've we've come back to the point of of how collaboration really makes us all stronger. So please go ahead, Sylvia. Yes, thank you. Yes, for, for collaboration, we're an agency who's always ready and willing to get involved with any conversation and collaboration. However, we have very limited, uh, rare conversations about the requirements that we, uh, you know, ask the institutions to meet. What we do do, however, there's two two items. Firstly, when we do a review and we're aware of the colleges being asked certain things from the ministry or certain other accrediting bodies, we try to review that wording so that it can match as closely as possible to what we are requiring. If there is, if there are synergies there, that's one of the ways. The other uh, way is that when the college informs us that they're already producing something for one of these other bodies, 
we accept this as evidence as long as they can point us to the answer in within this evidence. And so they can attach it uh, as evidence and say, you know, you'll find your answers in paragraph three and four. We do not ask for them to reformulate or re-articulate their answers so that it's consumable to us, even if it's in a format that wouldn't typically be offered as evidence. So those are ways that we work around these types of limits, limitations for the institutions. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for that insight. Um, well, we do have a couple of questions in the Q&A, and um, I invite our panelists to um, take a look through and respond to them in the next moments, a few moments before we conclude this session, um, because we are at time. But on behalf of Inquahe, thank you to all of the participants for joining this session um, and to the panelists, of course. Your, your questions and comments have really created an engaging session and we hope it was valuable to you and in your work. Um, and on behalf of myself and the panelists, I'd like to also thank Bia and Maria from the Inquahay Secretariat for all of their hard work in supporting and promoting this seminar. Um, we really couldn't do it without you. So thank you so much. Now I have two important announcements from Inquahay before we conclude. Um, First is to announce that registration is now open for our 2024 forum, which is hosted by Arachis. That's the Romanian Agency for Quality Assurance and Higher Education in Bucharest. And it's taking place um, early June. The theme this year is Transforming Society, Social Responsibility Through Quality Assurance of Tertiary Education. And we'll have focused sessions unpacking these issues um, provided by international experts. I believe that Maria and Bia have included the link here in the chat. So, um, so please do join us. We'd be delighted to have you. Um, I'll also note that as always, Inquahe also hosts pre-forum workshops to support the professional training and capacity building needs of our members. Um, and so we specifically develop them to support you. Um, we're pleased to announce this year that we'll be hosting a training session for ISG applicants so to walk you through the process. And we'll also have a Quality Assurance Foundations um, course. Uh, it's a full day workshop targeted towards supporting new and not so new quality assurance agency and institutional staff on theory and practice of quality assurance that uh, informs everyday work. So we'll sort of, we'll, we'll do sort of a 101 and dive deep into some of the contemporary issues that we're dealing with. So we really do hope that we'll join you or that you will join us um, in, in Bucharest this June. And then finally, I would also like to extend our invitation to work with us. We are a small but very dedicated global working board of directors at Inquahe, and we are currently running an open election process to fill seven positions. Uh, there are a variety of activities that we undertake at the board, and it really is an inspiring organization to be part of. Um, and we're also really well supported by our CEO, Fabrice Anard, and our secretariat staff, Bia and Maria, um, who are based in Barcelona. So, um, so if this interests you, I encourage you to go online at inquahey.org, or I believe that um, Bia and Maria may have also included it in the chat. There it is. Um, so please find out more about our organization and the nomination process. Um, I will note that the process does conclude, uh, process for nominations does conclude this Sunday, February 11th. So if it's something that interests you, please, please move quickly on it. We'd be like delighted to hear from you. Um, and I believe with that, I can close today's session. Um, thank you all very much for your time with us. Um, my sincere thanks to Vicky and Ronnie for engaging in the early development of this conversation and the panel. And Sylvie, thank you so much for stepping in on behalf of Karen. You, you did a, a wonderful, a wonderful job. Um, on very short notice. So we're, we're really grateful to you. So thank you. Um, thank you so thank much. Thank you Last very words. much, Mary. Yeah. Thanks to all of you, Terima Kasi, um, and uh, see you hopefully soon in Bucharest. Hopefully. Look forward to it. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.